r slash no sleep big libby and little libby this past october my great aunt elizabeth carter died in her sleep at the age of 90. her heart eyes and bones had been failing her for a while and she was in a poor state so her death wasn't all that shocking still it was sad and i had a lump in my throat when i went to her house with my mother and aunts to sort through her things while poking around the attic i found an old book with a cracked leather cover upon opening it i discovered it was a photo album filled with black and white snapshots of what appeared to be an old-time circus freak show dwarves giants people missing limbs and fat ladies paraded across the stage often wearing flamboyant costumes among them I recognized a teenage girl who resembled Aunt Elizabeth in her youth except she had what appeared to be a tiny doll sticking out of her chest. I went back downstairs and found my mom in the living room, sorting the many books in Elizabeth's living room bookshelves. Mom, you have some explaining to do, I said, handing her the photo album. What's this all about? A light of recognition dawned in her deep set blue eyes. Oh, Sarah. Did we never tell you? Tell me what? Was Aunt Elizabeth in a freak show? My head was spinning like an out-of-control amusement park ride. I knew Elizabeth had been a professional dancer and that she'd begun performing at an early age, but I'd never known she had a parasitic twin and was in a freak show. I don't get it I'm almost 20 and just learning about this now? I was incredulous and in shock. Sit down, honey, my mom sighed. I'll make some tea. I sat down on the couch and waited. It seemed like an hour before my mom finally came back in with a tea tray. She handed me a steaming cup and began. Your aunt was born with a parasitic twin attached at her breastbone. The twin was tiny, but perfectly formed, her head embedded inside Elizabeth. With four kids to support, her parents decided to have her exhibited. That's terrible. It wasn't to exploit her, my mom explained. They needed the extra money. Besides, during Elizabeth's time, there weren't many options for those who were disabled or deformed in some way. I still couldn't comprehend how anyone could be okay with turning their own child into an attraction, but I didn't know what to say, so I took a sip of the hot, sugary tea and waited. When Elizabeth was a baby, her parents would allow townspeople to come into their home and peer at her for a price of $10. Elizabeth became very popular, and when she was five, she was requited by a touring freak show known as Mr. Bardley's Human Oddities. Elizabeth performed under the stage name Big Libby and Little Libby. She would sing and dance for the crowds, and they all thought she was adorable. She soon became one of Bartley's most popular attractions. Well, at least she was successful, I muttered. Yes. She enjoyed it for the most part, anyway. My mom sighed. Of course, there were many downsides. Mr. Bartley was an insane, abusive man who treated his performers as objects rather than people and had no qualms against throwing them under the bus or manipulating them for his own personal gain. He had no respect for their dignity. Elizabeth was treated marginally better, as she was his favorite, but she still endured a lot of cruelty at Mr. Bardley's hand. When Elizabeth was 16, she became very ill. Her heart was under strain from pumping blood through both her and little Libby, and it became clear that if she wasn't removed, Elizabeth might die. I cupped my hand over my mouth. That's awful. Yes, my mom agreed with a nod. It was. Elizabeth would lose more than just her sister, she would also lose her livelihood, her career. When Mr. Bartley heard the news, he hit the roof. He yelled that Elizabeth was his star attraction and how could she abandon the show after he'd worked so hard to build her a career? Never mind that poor Elizabeth was dying. What an asshole, I muttered, and for once, my mom didn't correct me on my language. This is where things get ugly. My mom bit her lip, staring down into her cup. On the day before her surgery was to take place, Elizabeth was found lying unconscious in her bed, covered in blood. It appeared someone had given her a high dose of anesthetic, cut little Libby off at the neck, and crudely sewn the wound shut. Doctors had to reopen it so they could remove little Libby's head. That same day, Mr. Bartley skipped town, leaving no trace. Police theorized that he had somehow snuck into the hospital and amputated little Libby himself so he could keep her as some sort of sick prize. I nearly spat out the sip of tea I'd just taken. That's disgusting. To put it lightly, Elizabeth recovered and went on to marry and build a career as a dance teacher, which you already know. But she was so traumatized by the experience she refused to talk about it, and she didn't want her grandchildren and grandnieces to know. But what about Mr. Bartley? I asked. Did they ever find him? No, but four years after the initial crime, the body of a young woman Elizabeth's age was found dumped in a ditch on the outskirts of Chicago, Illinois. She had died of sepsis. 
But most shocking was the tiny headless body that had been sewn to her chest. My heart sank to my stomach, as hard and heavy as a stone. Tucked inside her dress were an old sideshow poster advertising Big Libby and Little Libby and Mr. Bartley's business card.